All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to be talking about five different tips and techniques for brewing in tight or rented spaces. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just wanna say welcome to the channel. Thanks for checking it out. Here, I will typically either do a grain to glass video or I'll do a shorter video on various homebrewing topics like the one you're watching right now. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button on this video. I do appreciate it quite a bit. So I've been brewing since about 2016, and the entire time I've lived in an apartment. Um, this is my third apartment I've had since then. But in every single case, I've been limited on space, I can't make modifications to the structures, I can't have any open flames, and obviously I need to be very careful about the amount of uh, damage that I inadvertently cause due to brewing. Many of my viewers out there, I'm sure, empathize with this because it is kind of a struggle. So once again, this is all based on my experience, which is very subjective. You may have a very different experience. Your apartment may be smaller or larger, or you might live in a place that allows you to make modifications to uh, the area, or you might just have completely different situations because you live in a different part of the world. So I'd ask you to take some of these suggestions with a grain of salt, but otherwise I do hope you find them all useful. So without further ado, I'm gonna share five of my favorite tips and techniques for brewing in a tight or rented space. So for the first technique, probably the biggest thing you wanna focus on in apartment brewing is space savings. We don't have all that much space to store a bunch of equipment, and one of the things you can save the most space on is actually your system. So it's my recommendation to actually use something called brew in a bag, and that is how I actually first started brewing all grain. And it is a one pot system. This means that you don't have to have a three vessel system. Your mash tun is your boil kettle. These types of systems are becoming very popular for good reason because they're very effective and they are good space and time savers. You won't get very much control over your mash or your sparge by doing this process, but it does have a tremendous benefit in space and time savings overall. But more specifically, I would highly recommend looking into something called an e-biab system or electric brew in a bag. Electric brew in a bag is what these all-in-one electric systems all revolve around. It takes the concept of brew in a bag and adds an electric element to it that can plug into pretty much any standard home outlet. Most standard outlets in the United States will run off of a 15 amp, 120 volt circuit. Uh, in some cases, you might get a 20 amp circuit in your kitchen, but for the most part, a 15 amp circuit is the most common. That allows you to run up to about a 1650 watt electric element for brewing on a single circuit. This is about the bare minimum required to bring five or so gallons of wort to a boil. If you need more volume than that, you're probably going to want to look at a 240 volt solution. Some people might have a 240 volt electric dryer outlet or a uh, stove outlet to use for this purpose, but not everyone does, and you have to be very careful with that. Do not do any sort of electric modifications without first consulting an actual licensed electrician. That is not my area of expertise. I just like to use the electric systems, but if you want to learn more about them and how to install them and how to make modifications to them properly, go check out Brian at Short Circuited Brewers. Everybody in the home brewing community knows who that guy is, but he's the electric systems guru. He's the guy to ask for questions about that sort of thing. Overall though, I think electric brew in the bag systems are probably the best solution for apartment brewers simply because of their ease of use and uh, space saving measures. So my claw hammer supply 120 volt system, I can actually run off of any outlet in my entire apartment if I wanted to. For the most part, I like to use it off of my back porch, but because uh, I like to be outside if I can, but sometimes you can't do that. And if you want to run it out of your kitchen outlets, that is a perfectly fine solution. However, the Clawhammer supply system is just one of many. There's more affordable versions in the Anvil Foundry and more expensive versions in the Spike Solo. And there are many other systems in between. I would recommend doing your research before looking into one of these systems, but if you have any questions about the Clawhammer supply system specifically, I can help you out with that. Tip number two is all about heat sources. Many of us, myself included, have an open flame clause in our lease, which prevents us from having things like propane burners or grills or anything that has you know, an open flame uh, for you know risk of burning the apartment down. So obviously I can't use a propane burner to heat up anything for brewing. I am limited to only electric elements or my stove. My stove is an ancient electric stove from like 1980. It can't bring five gallons of anything to a boil, so it needs help. If you're looking at just using your stove for brewing, you're probably gonna wanna stick to extract or partial mash or just brew a smaller batch size. Uh, another option, of course, is to brew a double strength wort and then dilute it with uh, some clean water. Most people's stoves are probably gonna struggle to bring enough wort for a five gallon batch up to a good boil. So sometimes you need to get creative with your heating sources. And one item that I use to supplement my boils with for a very long time is this. This is called the Hot Rod Heat Stick and it is made by brewhardware.com. I'll drop a link down in the description if you wanna check this out. And what it is is a 1650 watt ultra low wattage density element, which is just hooked up to a regular 
plug, which you then put into a GFCI outlet in your kitchen. The stove plus this heat stick really create a very vigorous boil. Um, and this is actually the exact same element that's inside most of the electric systems that use 120 volt circuits. So if you wanted to ever build your own electric fur in a bag system, this is a good start. Another option out there, if you have the right type of kettle, is an induction burner. An induction burner, you can simply plug into an outlet again, um, basically it uses magnetic fields to heat up the bottom of your kettle uh, without actually using direct heat. And it actually is pretty effective. There's a lot of uh, induction cooktops that are coming out nowadays that uh, use the same exact concept. Not every single type of kettle is compatible with induction burners, so do your research if you want to go down that route. That will provide about the same level of uh, boil as one of these single electric elements would provide on its own. And I'll say this one more time, if you happen to have access to a 240 volt circuit and can safely hook up your brewing equipment to that circuit, you're probably going to want to use that for your brewing process simply because that is going to be so much more power going into the boil. It's going to give you a much better brewing process and faster heating times, which overall are a very good thing. So the third tip is about cleanup. If many of us are working in an apartment, we probably only have access to one sink in the kitchen, and it's probably not a very big sink. It probably doesn't have that much space, nor does it have that much power coming out of the faucet to, to blast down your equipment with. It's a really simple modification, however, to give yourself a lot more reach and a lot more power out of your sink. And that is to take a piece of silicone tubing, just like you would use for your high temp transfer lines. So on one end of it, you have a garden hose attachment like you would get with most chiller setups. And then what you do is you have a little adapter here and you can get this at most hardware stores or a brewing store specifically. And that steps you down from the garden hose thread into the thread for your faucet. So now you can hook this up to your sink. And then just on top of that, I added a typical quick connect so that I can hook it up to like my chiller or my pump or anything else that I have to clean um, and I want to blast out ball valves or whatever, uh, I can use this to hook up to it. Um, plus it also keeps the hose from flying all over the place. So not only does this give me about six feet of overall reach from my faucet, but also gives me the full flow rate. It's not limited by the aerator on the faucet. I can actually go ahead and use my full water pressure uh, to blast away at things uh, when I'm cleaning. And it really comes in handy for me. It also allows me to fill things much faster uh, if I'm using my tap water for like sanitizer. Uh, and it's especially useful, I think, for cleaning kegs as well, since I can actually get up in there and uh, it gives me the ability to get around to some hard to reach spaces and other types of equipment. So this is one of the first things I did when I moved in here and it has been an absolute game changer for brewing. Uh, um, to the point where I kind of took it for granted and never told anybody about it. So um, if you've been struggling with using your kitchen sink in your apartment to clean your brewing equipment with, um, then I would look into this or just use your bathtub. For a number of reasons, I prefer kegging over bottling. So versus bottling, kegging really saves a tremendous amount of time and effort for me. But believe it or not, I actually believe kegging is gonna be better than bottling if you happen to be in a tight space. So if you're bottling your homebrew, you're gonna need about 48 to 50 plus bottles uh, in order to package one five gallon batch of beer. You need to spend probably about three hours on your bottling day actually packaging all the beer and then cleaning on top of that. Once those are full, you need a space to store these large boxes of bottles. Uh, you need to be able to condition them for a couple weeks before enjoying them. But then every time you open a beer, you have to rinse out that bottle and clean it. It's probably gonna take up space on your countertop, on your sink, random places around your house, depending how clean you are. Ultimately, it'll probably end up either in the dishwasher or just in your sink waiting to be cleaned. And sometimes you may not get to it and it might get moldy and crusty in the bottom and it's just a pain in the butt. When you're kegging, all you have to do is transfer into a clean and sanitized keg and then put it on CO2 and you're done. And it takes about an hour if you're moving really slowly. And then you don't have to worry about cleaning anything or putting anything away until after your keg is completely empty. Now there's a flip side to this concept and that is probably where people are gonna push back, rightly so, and say this is not necessarily a space saver. Because you have to keep your kegs cool. You have to keep a dedicated fridge or freezer or some type of uh, system there so that you can serve them um, at a cold temperature. Now drilling lines for taps through your apartment's refrigerator that's probably included in the lease is just not a good idea, so I wouldn't do that. But you can still find secondhand fridges and freezers on Craigslist for like under $100 in most cases, and there you have your kegerator. Now if you're only working with two or three kegs, you can also put those things in a very slim, small chest freezer, then put a draft tower up top of it, and it actually might look like it belongs in your apartment. And a lot of these things also come down to appearance too. Like if your landlord walks through your apartment one day and sees your meth lab of a brewing setup and sees all of these empties lying around, it's probably not gonna be good for you. But if it's tight 
tidy and it's clean and you do have a four tap kegerator sitting around, they're probably gonna have a little less complaints. But your mileage may vary. Your landlord might suck, your landlord might be awesome, your landlord might drink your beer, you never know. But regardless of the amount of space that you're working with, unless it's an extremely tiny space, I would highly recommend going to kegs over bottles because it just simply is a tremendous time and effort saver and you're probably gonna end up doing it at some point anyway. And for our last tip, we're taking it over to the kitchen here where I'm gonna show you how I organize all my stuff. I really like these collapsible shelving units here. You can get them online. You can also find them at your big chain box stores like Target or Walmart or whatever. And I like these because if you need to move from place to place, they're real easy to break down and compact. The whole thing fits down to something about that thick by that wide. You can also configure the height of each individual shelf very easily, allowing you to kind of customize where you want to put different pieces of equipment or uh, things like that. I think one of the biggest challenges in an apartment is just keeping organized and keeping things clean. Um, and if you're not really careful about that, it'll get away from you. So I figured I'd just show you the way that I set my stuff up. Your situation may be different. Adapt this to your own space. So on the bottom here, I have grain storage. I'm actually working on getting some more uh, airtight storage solutions for the grain down here, but I have my grain and then I have my kettles and other uh, systems. The claw hammer system is down here as well. In the next shelf up here, I have all of my bottling stuff. Uh, yes, I do occasionally still bottle things. I also have airlocks and various types of bags in here, hot bags, brewing bag bags. And right here I have my water chemistry box. This has all my water salts in it, some lactic acid, a little scale, some pH uh, calibration solution, and stuff like that. And then on the other side of this I have all the items that I use every single brew day, things that are components of the claw hammer system, um, as well as just other useful things like the refractometer that I use. And the next shelf up here, I have uh, my cleaning supplies, and this is where I also hang all of my tubing when it's not being used. I also have a box full of other accessories. There's lots of just random hardware in here, like ring clamps and tubing. Lots and lots of kegging supplies as well are also living in here. So that's where that's kind of like my random stuff box. Um, it always ends up being pretty useful. Anything tri-clamp related is in here, so that's where I got my gaskets and my clamps, as well as the other accessories that I have for the Spike CF5, they're all in here. My yeast starter flask and equipment is back there as well. On this next shelf up here, I have more consumables. Um, I have my oxygen tanks for when I uh, oxygenate the wort. Um, I have some lime cleaner, some yeast nutrient, some whirl flock gelatin, and yeast starter, uh, canned starter worts. And then last but not least, on the very top shelf is where I keep all of my backup equipment. This is where I have like an extra pump, an extra chiller, a couple extra uh, electric heating elements, as well as um, a capper and some other extra stuff that just sits up there. All in all though, this keeps all my brewing equipment out of the way and it keeps the clutter in my apartment down to a bare minimum. It keeps me organized and it makes the whole place look a little bit better. The one thing not pictured here are my fermenters and that is because they are indeed, well, they're in random corners of the apartment. Anyway, guys, I really hope you learned something and enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit that like button. Please subscribe for more content like this. If you're also an apartment brewer and you have other tips and techniques not covered here that you want to share with us, please go ahead, drop those in the comment section down below. If you came to this video looking for advice and tips, don't forget to check out the comment section because there is a lot of wisdom down there and there's a lot of people who have uh, different living setups than I do and that might pertain more to your situation. So don't forget to check that stuff out. If you want to support this channel, please don't forget to check out the merchandise store that's down below the description box where you can get this t-shirt and many others uh, that might suit your fancy. Another way to support the channel is to go click through the links that are in the description box for some of the homebrewing gear that I recommend if you happen to be in the market for it. And of course, if you want to support the channel, on a more personal basis, I also have a Patreon. Thanks to my current Patreon supporters, you guys are doing awesome things for this channel and I wouldn't be able to do it all without you. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, um, where I will post a little bit more frequently than I do on YouTube. Uh, so check that out if you're interested in that. So I realized I left my beer over there, so now I have one. Thanks for watching all the way to the end, guys. I really do appreciate the watch time. It does mean a lot for the channel. Thank you so much and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, Cheers.